into our text. As I mentioned a while ago, I'm going to, I was studying this and decided that it would be better just to uh, not try to fit it all in uh, this morning, so I'll uh, finish the message uh, this evening, but um, we'll look at actually the majority of it this morning, right? Acts chapter 14, we've been in uh, Acts uh, 14, we looked at the first five or six verses last week, and so now let's uh, go to verse 6, I'm in Romans, that's not going to work, is it? <laughs> This is the first missionary journey uh, you see here. All right, uh, it started in Acts 13, and they've just been continuing on. Uh, they left Antioch of Syria, and then they went to Cyprus. All right, uh, we, we saw that a few chapters ago. Then they went to the mainland. They went through Perga, and then to Antioch of Pisidia. Uh, and each, almost each one of these places they've been, there's been riots. They've been run out of town. All right, uh, but they've seen believers. They've seen people saved. And last week, we saw them at Iconium, and uh, they're uh, in, in that region. Notice they're in this, the dark green area uh, up uh, at the top there. It's called Galatia, and uh, this is the region that uh, Paul would later write a letter that was included in our Bibles called the Galatians, okay? So these churches in this, in this area, this is who he was writing to when he wrote the book of Galatians. That was the letter to these early believers, okay? And so uh, this morning, we're going to look in the next uh, set of verses, they go to the next town. They go to Lystra, and then eventually they go to Derby, And that actually is where the first missionary journey ends, and then they, they make their way back, all right, to, to Antioch of, of Syria. And so, again, that gives you a, a visual as to where they are uh, geographically and uh, how they were moving. Sometimes you, you, I mean, just reading all these names, you think, well, was it just like one town over, or was it, you know, a great distance? Well, it, 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 it varies, you know. Sometimes uh, it was a long distance. Sometimes uh, it was uh, quite a journey. And other times it was just, you know, a small trek, so to speak. So um, that gives you an idea as to where they're at and uh, that some of the difficulties they were facing uh, as far as geographically. Um, uh, where they are, there's a mountain range there, all right. Uh, Galatia in the south there. Uh, Pamphylia is the uh, region south of that. And there's a great mountain range there. That, that divides that. And so uh, it was quite a this, uh, decision to go north into Galatia there, all right? But uh, that's how the Lord led them. And so uh, let, let's go ahead and read our text. And uh, I'll, I'll turn that off here. I'll tell you what, let me go ahead and do that. And then that won't be a distraction to me or anybody else, all right? And uh, we'll get started in our text. There's interesting things that happen in the work of the Lord. Amen. And that's what we're going to see uh, here in Lystra. So let's start in Acts 14 and verse 6. It says, They were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Laontia, and unto the region that lieth round about. Uh, they were aware of it. There were riots in Iconium, okay? And um, uh, there were Jews that had come out uh, to run them out of town. And we looked at that last week. And so uh, when uh, the Lord gave them liberty, they left town, all right? And so now they're going to these next cities, the Lystra and Derby. And verse 7, there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw that what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Laontia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priests of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, 
which would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. We'll stop our reading uh, there for this morning. Here we see a, a very interesting um, uh, set of events, all right? A very interesting reaction. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, Paul did not expect this. Um, in, in, in thinking about this and the miracle that he performed, you know, the, the miracles, we have to remember, were not there just for uh, meeting a need. Now, he was a lame man. Uh, it says he was lame from his mother's, you know, from birth. Uh, he never walked. And he had a need. Now, Paul met a physical need, but it was not just to meet a physical need. Uh, it was also there to validate the message of the gospel. And that's exactly, no doubt, what Paul was thinking. And uh, being led of the Holy Spirit, that's probably why that God allowed him. That's why God gave him the gift of, of healing to be able to validate the message of the gospel. Because at that time, uh, in the early church, they didn't have the whole Bible in order to, to go back and look and say, well, what does this scripture say about that? You couldn't uh, compare scripture with scripture because you didn't have all the scriptures. And so God was validating himself with signs and wonders all right, in the early church. Uh, that's why we don't have signs and wonders today, because we have the Bible. We don't need those signs and wonders. Amen? So uh, here we see that, and, and God giving Paul that ability, but that's not what happened. Rather than the message being validated and the people then believing it, the people believed in Paul rather than God. The exact opposite. Uh, and, and that's, the, of course, exactly not, exa opposite of what Paul would have wanted. And, and now he's on the defense. Rather than being on the offense and saying, yes, you see the power of God. This is, this is God. Uh, Christ, the Jewish Messiah. He was the real uh, Son of God. He came, He died, He was resurrected, and now He's offering forgiveness of sins, not only to the Jewish people, but to all nations. And this is legitimate because you see His power demonstrated. They said, no, that was your power. You did that. <laughs> that was you. And you must be one of the gods that come down, and, and here's your counterpart, and He's come down with you, and wow, we are among the gods. And, and they began to worship them. And right away, Paul said, whoa, 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 wait, wait. wait. Back up here, you know, and had to be on the defense. Mm -hmm. So here we see again, and uh, I've entitled this the deification in Lystra. All right, uh, going through Acts, I've been using deeds for some reason. Okay, so uh, here they uh, made them as deities. All right, they wanted to worship them. Of course, it says in the text that uh, Paul and Barnabas stopped them from doing that, but that was their intent. All right. And we'll see uh, what Paul told them, amen, and uh, how they respond to this. You know, it's interesting, in the verses we read, nowhere does it say that anybody got saved. Now, we know that was the purpose, all right? That was what, that was what Paul was desiring. And you, we read through some of the other meetings and, and the other cities, and it says many believe, some believe, and, and such. But... From the verses we've just read, there's no mention of anyone getting saved in Lystra. Now, I won't uh, harp on that too much because that's part of the message tonight. All right? That, that, that's, the, that's the goodie, okay? <laughs> that's the custard. You have to come back for the custard tonight. We're going to uh, chew on the meat this morning, all right? But uh, the, the, it is important to note that no one got saved, it appears, in Lystra. And, and no doubt that would be discouraging to the Apostle Paul. You know, here he's, he's faced this these difficulties, uh, he's been misunderstood, and, and now he's got to go on the defense. He's on the run constantly from one city to the next, and uh, yes, he's got you know people being saved and such, but he's constantly having to, to move along because he's constantly being hunted down, and it just seems like one thing after another, and now he gets here, and God allows him to perform a miracle, and yet no one gets it. How discouraging that could be. And yet Paul was faithful. Amen. Paul was faithful. 
we want to look at uh, the, the, this account, and we see two or three things here. Right? We see, first of all, the message that Paul preached. We see the miraculous healing that God allowed him to do. And then we see the mistake that the people made. And sadly, it's, it's a mistake that uh, happens even today. Even today. All right? And so uh, God uh, warns us about that. And here, what God would have us to learn, I believe, is that we must remain faithful, even in the midst of difficult, difficult times. Amen? We must remain faithful. That's what, exactly what Paul did. And uh, we must uh, <clears throat> recognize the true gospel and recognize that uh, it's not man, it's not men, but it is God that works. Amen? It's God that saves. Amen? And uh, <coughs> it's God that is, uh, offers salvation. Let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our, our verses. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to meet in your house. And Lord, we pray that you would bless your word. Now, as we look at, uh, we've read the verses. We pray that, Lord, you would speak to our hearts. Lord, you would teach us. Uh, Lord, encourage us. Lord, most of all, that you would change us. Lord, make us uh, more fit, Lord, to serve you, that we would be uh, better witnesses for you, that we would be better uh, Christians, Lord, overall, that you would just work in our lives. We pray you get honor and glory in this time. Pray you guide my words and thoughts, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Pray, Lord, there be nothing in me that will keep you from, uh, Lord, uh, working in each heart. And, Lord, you do your work here this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, this area here is it's mentioned a couple of times, Laoncia, and uh, that's my pronunciation of it, okay? Uh, I have worked on this uh, past several days, and that's as close as I'm going to get, all right? So Laoncia, okay? It was a Roman province uh, here in the southern part of Galatia. Um, it was bordered on the south by Cilicia and Phygeria. Uh There's Pisidia. And so uh, this is, you know, one of those local areas. Okay, it wasn't a, a, a huge area as far as population and such, but uh, no doubt that there's obviously people here, all right? And um, it, its history had been very independent, okay? Uh, you might say this is the, the, the mountain people. Yeah, this is the, the, the backwoods, all right? And um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that plays into the, the account here, all right? But um, they've come here, and first of all, we see the message, all right? Uh, go back to verses 6 and 7. Uh, right away, we see uh, the example of uh, Paul. Let's see. I lost my place here in my Bible. <laughs> I turned the page too, too far. Here we go. Uh, verses 6 and 7. Uh, verse 7 says, And there they preached the gospel. Uh, to preach. To preach. It means to proclaim the good news. And yeah, that's what we need to be doing. All right? Now you say, Pastor, I'm not a preacher. I, I, I'm not, you know, I don't get up in front of people and I, I'm not, I don't do what you're doing this morning. Well, I understand that, okay? But you know, we're all, we've all been told to preach. Even, even ladies, uh, you can preach. Now you can't pastor, but you can preach. Amen? Uh, you can proclaim the good news. That's what it means. Uh, I think the Greek word there is evangelize, all right? evangelizo, all right? It's the, the word we get our English word evangelize, and it means to share the good news. And that's exactly what they were doing. Everywhere they went, every town they were in, they went to share the good news. Uh, well, there's an application there for us. Everywhere we go, we ought to be taking the opportunity to share the good news. Uh, we need to have gospel tracts uh, in our hand. We need to have a John and Romans in our car, uh, maybe in, a, in our you know, ladies in your purse. Uh, wherever, you, you need to be ready. Amen? Have your dagger. Amen? You know, we talk about the Bible being the sword of the Spirit. Well, we need to have our old dagger. Amen? I keep my dagger in the car. A uh, little New Testament, Soul Winner's New Testament. And um, uh, this, this week I went and visited a lady, and uh, <clears throat> she was in the hospital, and I took my New Testament with me and uh, took a John of Romans. You know, uh, always be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within us and be ready to share the gospel. Everywhere they went, that's what Paul and Barnabas were doing. They were preaching the, the gospel, I mean, sharing the good news that men could be saved. And then we see this second thing here, the miraculous healing, all right? Uh, look in, in verse 8. There sat a certain man, that Lister, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. Uh, the significance of this, uh, the Lord gives us the details in verse 8 there, indicating that this was real. Okay? Um, showing that this was not someone that just uh, you know, had, had sprained her ankle or something. You know, this man had never walked. You know, a lot of times you, you see these guys on TV or... 
You maybe you've seen some churches, you know, and they're going to have a healing service. And they're going to do a healing. And they're going to heal people of cancer. They're going to heal people of, you know, some disease they have. Well, if they were legitimate, why don't they go to the hospitals, you know? And why don't they, uh, you know, bless some amputees with new arms and limbs? Why don't they, you know, uh, go to these uh, people that are blind and they cannot see and restore their sight? You know, that's what Jesus did. All right, that's what Paul did here. All right, uh, this man he reminds me very much of Bartimaeus. All right, back in um, uh, there in uh, in Jerusalem, all right, or in Jericho. All right, uh, in, in Jesus's ministry, and this man he never walked, so it was obvious to everyone there in, in Lystra that this man, uh, if he was going, and it says he was up leaping and walking, uh, that he was healed. All right, this was no joke. This was legitimate. All right, so we, first of all, we see it's authentic. Uh, here the Holy Spirit reiterates it three times, uh, his, his case. And we also see here uh, in, in verse 9 uh, the attention that Paul gave him. Uh, it says, Steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Now, uh, it doesn't tell us what Paul saw. I don't know if, you know, Paul just saw this man just listening on the edge of his seat or maybe maybe the man began to cry a little bit or, or, or what it was that got Paul's attention but somehow Paul recognized this man's giving it this man understands the message he's not just here you know curious like maybe the rest of the crowd he's not just here to see what's going to happen next uh, he's not here uh, you know waiting to um, start an argument uh, you know, and or he's not here as you know, maybe a spy from Iconium and some of the other cities that, that the Jews have sent out to see what I'm going to do next and, and, you know, and cause a riot. No, this man is legitimate. This is real. And, you know, we, we might say, well, that was, you know, part of Paul's gift. He just had, uh, you know, he, he was the, Paul the apostle, pastor. I mean, you know, he had the gift. Well, it's not just a gift, okay? It's discernment. And there's an application for us here, church. You know, we need to be keenly aware of the needs of those around us. We, we interact with people on the job, in our home, all the time. People out, you know, in town, at, at the fuel station, at, at warehouse, wherever God, you know, our, our business leads us in. And God brings these people into our paths, and they're hurting got real needs. And we say, oh, we got to get on our way. You know, man, you know, get, top it up and take off. You know, well, what about that guy out there at the fuel center that's washing your window, what your windscreen, you know, that, that's topping up for you? You know, he, he's, he's probably got some questions. He's probably, he probably needs a gospel drive. Mm. You know, what about that cashier that's taking, taking your, your money? Uh, she, she probably needs to invite the church. You know, yeah, uh, I, I'm amazed how God brings people along our paths often at just the right time, you know? And it, it's just the right opportunity. And yet, if we're not looking for it, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. And here, Paul, he was aware that this man was sensitive to the gospel. And so he took the opportunity that he was going to not only uh, share Christ with this man, but then he was going to offer him a healing. Mm -hmm. Now, that, of course, was, un, you know, that was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And again, the, the gift of healing was for the New Testament church, all right, the early church, sign gifts, all right? But here, he recognizes the need of this man, and he was aware of this man's need. And boy, we need to be sensitive to other people's needs. Amen? Uh, let, let's not get so busy in life that we just pass by those that God brings into our path on purpose. Amen? Let, let's be sensitive to the spiritual needs of those around us. And, and notice here then uh, the, the authority that Paul used in, in verse 10, all right? Uh, it says, uh, Paul said unto him with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Uh, Paul did not uh, do this in a corner, so to speak. He didn't, now, I, I'm going I'm to do something here. And if um, you just stand up right now, and, and then you can just go on. Well, what would you say? Yeah. 
Now, he, he did it in front of everybody. He called him out. He says, you there, stand up and stand up right and walk. What? This foreigner, he, <laughs> what's he doing telling this? That, that's our, that's like our, you know, uh, our, uh, our bum in the town. He, he's, he's the guy that everybody knows he can't walk. He can't work a job. He's never held a job in his life. He's never, he didn't even go to school because he's lame. And we all just, he's a beggar. What's this guy, Paul, come into town? He's preaching about this Jesus, and now he's going to command this, this beggar to stand up and walk. He can't do that. He did. And guess what? The lame man did. He stood upright and walked. Paul wasn't going to do this just in a corner and then just, you know, uh, kind of discreet. No, Paul, again, you have to remember the, the aim, the, the purpose of this healing was not just to meet this man's need, but to uh, declare that Paul's message, that the gospel was valid and legitimate and that it was the power of God unto salvation. The power of God that just raised this man up off his feet and gave him the power to walk and healed his legs, who he's been lame all his life, is the same power that can change your life and give you the power to walk in newness of life. That was the message in the miracle. Amen. And that's what Paul was trying to get across to these people at Lystra. And this man, he was healed. And, and Paul was not ashamed to declare that. Amen. Uh, he did it boldly. He did it with authority. And, and uh, declared that he should stand up right and walk. And he did. Amen. Uh, boy, the power of God demonstrated uh, in the life of this, of this man is wonderful. So we see the authority then that Paul spoke with. Uh, he, he wasn't, you know, uh, the, the story's told, uh, I'll, I'll share this. The story's told of George Mueller one, one time. Uh, on one occasion, he was preaching and a baby began to cry. Now, I, I won't do this, all right? I don't think I'll do this. Uh, but uh, George Mueller, you know, he was a man of great faith. And um, he would pray for hours and hours. Uh, I've read his biography. It's just amazing. Uh, the uh, monies and, and the needs he prayed in uh, for his orphanage. He, he supported hundreds of children. And I think he was about 70 years of age and he did the unthinkable. He'd become a missionary. <laughs> you, know, you know, if you know anything about mission work, you don't do that in, in your retirement, in, in your golden years. You do that in the prime of your life. You do that when you're young. You know, that, that's something you do as a, as a, a young man. You know, but uh, no, in his golden years, and when he was supposed to be set, supposedly, he decided to <laughs> go into missions. And they just trusted God. And, and he prayed for so many things. And uh, it's unbelievable his prayer journal that he kept and how God met so many needs. He had a, an unbelievable faith, all right? And it said that George Mueller, one time, he was preaching, and a baby began to cry in the service. And the mother, just natural instinct, all right? And this is what I would, uh, most of our moms do, okay? Amy, Amy said, do this, you know? You just take, take the, the baby out and, and take him to the crash or whatever. Well, George Mueller, he said... <laughs> He told this woman, he said, sit down, sister. The Lord will calm the child. <laughs> and you know what? The Lord did. <laughs> I mean, what, a, what an incredible faith. You know, just that, uh, Lord, you can, you can quiet the child, and it'll be all right. Uh, there's no need for her to leave. You know, maybe she was unsaved. And, and George Miller had the awareness to say, hey, you need to sit down and save the service. <laughs> Let the Lord take care of your baby. You're going to get saved, you know. Hey, that kind of faith. That kind of authority, hey, amen. That, that's the kind of authority that Paul was speaking with here. He says, you, sir, there, you, stand up right and walk. And he did, hey, amen. Uh, Paul had the uh, awareness to see people's need, and he could trust God with authority, hey, amen, and see God do incredible things. Boy, we need that kind of awareness. We need that kind of faith, hey, amen, just like the Apostle Paul. Well, we see the miracle that took place here, but then we see the third thing. We see the mistake, all right? Uh, <clears throat> verse 11, it said, They saw the people saw what Paul had done. They lifted up their voices in, uh, in the speech of Leoncia and said, Then gods are come down to us the likeness of men. And we, we read how they called Barnabas Jupiter uh, and, and uh, Paul, uh, or, uh, yeah, Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, all right? Then, verse 13, the chief priest uh, before the city brought oxen and garlands under the gates, would have been sacrificed with the people. Wow. Now, this isn't just, you know, a pat on the back or, you know, a, a good handcuff. Oh, that was a pretty good show. I don't know how you did that. That was pretty amazing. No, this was, we're going to worship you. Wow. And, and so, right away, there was a problem. 
you know, we, uh, we have to remember, this is the Gentile world, all right? Um, Paul, of course, <coughs> he would normally go to the synagogues and, and preach to the Jews first. That is not recorded here in Lystra. There may not have been a synagogue in Lystra. So, you know, there was not that opportunity and such. Uh, he was preaching directly to the Jews, or to the Gentiles straight away. And so the Gentiles, in contrast to the Jews who worship one God, and that they were proud of that, the Gentiles worshiped all kinds of gods. They had temples and, and you know, believed in all kinds of gods, you know, you know, Greek mythology and all that stuff. And, and they believed that the gods were, uh, you know, had all kinds of personalities and such and uh, different kind of uh, things you could appease uh, appeal to different gods for and such, you know. And so that was very common. And now that they have a man who has just done the supernatural and, and healed someone, well, they attribute it to one of their gods. Now, the scriptures don't tell us this, but um, I was reading this. You know, the historical record uh, says that there was actually a, like a, a legend or in, in this area. That's why I say um, th these may have been kind of the back. Backwoods people, all right. The, you know, we say the mountain people, so to speak. Um, uh, here in New Zealand, we say they're the West Coasties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're on the North Island. I can say that, all right? Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, there was a legend that this kind of event had happened before. That uh, these gods had come down, the god of, of Jupiter and uh, Mercurius, and they had come and visited a couple before in their home. And as a result of this couple that hosting these gods, they had been blessed. Well, if it happened before and now it's happened again, hey, we're not going to miss the opportunity to get a blessing from the gods. And so right away, these, these you know, uh, unbelievers, they saw an opportunity to be blessed by their false gods. And so they were going to take advantage of it. They were going to uh, offer sacrifice. They were going to pay homage. They were going to do all kinds of things in order to gain the blessing of their false gods. And so that kind of you know, uh, plays into their reaction here, all right? Why they were doing this uh, with Paul and Barnabas. You know, sadly, that is often what religion does, even today. Now, we don't, we don't see people offering animal sacrifices and such, but boy, we see, we see people enamored with leaders. We see people enamored with individuals with you know personalities wow that you know Bob name names or not boy that Joel Osteen you know he just wow what a guy you know you know he denies Christ he embraces homosexuality he does all kinds of things that are contrary to the word of God and yet people look to him as just the the, the, the best preacher on earth and, and, and yeah, uh, and that, that, that's just one example. All right, uh, they look at these healers. Yeah, you know, oh that Benny Hinn. Yeah, you know, wow, what a what a man. He can just uh, bless and, and and work all kind of wonders. You know, and on and on we could go. And th there's th those are some of the, the biggest examples. All right, uh, th there's less examples. All right, but we get people and, and lost people majority and uh, majority. Uh, but even some people can get distracted with. A personality, a leader. Oh, this speaker, well, boy, if, if he could come, and if he would be, you know, there, boy, that would just be a great conference. You know, just, oh, wow, that would be so good to hear this, this pastor, this minister. And if, if, you know, he was there speaking, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The power's not in the man. The power is in the message, not the man. Yeah, I, I've said this before. Uh, I think I said it a few weeks ago. I hope you don't come on Sunday morning to get you know entertained, because if you are, you're, you're <laughs> you need to get your money back. <laughs> because I, I'm a poor I'm a poor show. All right, uh, we're not here to be entertained. I'm not here to you know tickle your ears. I'm here to tell you, thus saith the Lord, and, and give you the message that God has given us this morning. Amen. And in here, that's exactly though the mistake that these people in Lister were making. They weren't uh, so in, in, uh, uh, interested in what Paul and Barnabas were preaching. They wanted to see with the performance. What are you going to do next? You're one of the gods. And what can you give me? Because we've heard how you visited us before and you blessed certain individuals. Well, what can you do for us this time? What can we do to earn your favor? 
Oh, we'll sacrifice even our best oxen. We'll, we'll pay homage. We'll give you a parade. We'll do all these things. And they were enamored with a man. And sadly, many times. You know, think about, and, um, <clears throat> you know, think about the, even the Catholic Church and the Pope. How many follow that man? And whatever he says is gospel. I'm sorry, friends, but any individual, any human being on this earth is only a man. He's only a man. And yet, so many people follow after leaders like that. And here, that's what we see happening in, in Lystra. So they made the, the mistake of following after the, uh, Paul and Barnabas. Notice then how Paul corrects it, all right? Um, and it, it's interesting here, too, there, there's, there's a lesson to be learned, and this is just a, this is a side note, but it says in verse, um, where is it? Uh, it's in verse 12, I believe. Yeah, verse 11, I'm sorry. They were saying in the speech of Leoncia, you know, um, there, there's a lesson there. We need to be careful here. Paul and Barnabas were in a different culture. And they didn't know the native language. You know, um, <clears throat> uh, in, in a much less uh, way, it'd be me, like me, trying to understand uh, some of the things you say when I first got here four years ago. Uh, and they, they're still, you know, every now and then I'm like, what what would you say? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, we need to make sure we understand each other, amen? And here, uh, all this was going on, and Paul and Barnabas like, what, what are they doing now? Well, they have a party. <laughs> Who's that guy? Well, he sure is dressed up. He's, you know, he's, this, he's this priest, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they realize, wait a minute, this is, <laughs> this is more than what we bargained. This is not what we wanted. And so there was a, a miscommunication error there. And boy, we need to make sure we understand each other, amen? As we're presenting the gospel, uh, there, there's a lesson to be learned there in, um, in presenting the, the message. But let, let's keep looking down then, all right? Um, what did Paul do? How did Paul respond? Look at verse 15. He's saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you. First of all, he acknowledged their passions. It's, it's the same Greek word, same phrase, same English phrase even that James used of Elijah. You know, Elijah called down fire from heaven. Elijah, he slew 300, I believe it is, prophets of Baal in the Old Testament. Elijah did all, Elijah raised someone from the dead. Elijah went to heaven on a chariot of fire. And yet, we get to the New Testament and the Holy Spirit says he was a man just like any other man. He was just a man of like passions. All that he did was just a man. You know, God forbid that we ever glory in ourselves, amen? Yet it's, it, it's sad many times, uh, especially lost people, will get enamored with an individual, but we need to be careful not to think too highly of ourselves. Yes. Amen? Uh, we're just all sinners saved by the grace of God. Yes, we're sinners saved, amen? But we are just men of like passions, women of like passions. We are all individuals that God chooses to use, amen? And Paul, he says, you don't need to worship us. <laughs> We're one among you. We're, we're just the same. We're all uh, sinners in need of saving. And here then he begins to proclaim uh, the, <clears throat> the, the message here. He says, we're men of like passions. We preach to you that you should turn from these vanities <laughs> unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things that are therein. Uh, he, he called them out on what they were doing. He said, all these things you're doing, all this, this offering, this sacrifice you're about to make, you've called in the priest, and all these things you're going to do, this is vanity. It's vanity. Yeah, you know, there, there are many people, and, and like I said, they, they follow a man, and they'll do whatever the man says. Whatever that religion. You know, this morning we looked at Mormonism in uh, Sunday school, and how uh, people have followed after the teaching of one man. And no matter what you know, anybody else says, no matter what the Bible says, whatever that man taught, uh, whether it makes sense or not, then we're going to follow after him. And they do all these things, and they're trying to earn their way to heaven, whether it be Mormonism or you know, Confucius or the Catholic Church, and it's all vanity. It's not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy, 
be saved us. Amen. It's, it's only by the grace of God that we can be saved. Uh, we are not saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. And, and here, that's what Paul he says. All this is vanity. All that you're trying to do here, these offerings and such, it's all vanity. And then he says, we preach unto you. And what were they preaching? He turns right back to his message. He said, you should turn from, to the living God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that are there in. Yeah, I was actually, I was going to tell Jared, I didn't tell him this morning, but I wanted to sing, How Great Thou Art. And the Lord just put it, put it in Jared's heart. How great thou art. Hey, you know what? God has not left man. In fact, that's what Paul says then. Let's keep reading. He says that in times past, uh, he suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. And that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. You know, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, we won't turn it for time's sake, but it says that uh, Paul asked the question, to the Gentiles, despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It is the goodness of God. It is his mercies. Yeah, Lamentations 324. Uh, Jeremiah, he wrote, he says, It's of the Lord's mercies. We are not consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. He wrote that in the midst of the destruction of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah. And yet, Jeremiah could look and say, the temple is gone. Our city is gone. We've been led away as captives. We're slaves in Babylon. And yet, God is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. You will not forget us. You will, you will, we will return again. Your promises are renewed every morning. You will not forget your people. And God is good even to the lost. He's left a witness. Yeah, this morning, I, I don't know anybody's heart, but here this morning, if, if you're here and you've never been saved, and you, you, uh, you're, you're wondering, well, is this real? Is this legitimate? Is, is salvation the real deal? Uh, is Jesus Christ the real deal? Look back over your life. Yeah, the fact that you're here this morning and that you're hearing the message of salvation, you have one more opportunity to be saved. It's the goodness of God leading you to repentance. If you've never come to Christ, he's given you one more chance to do that this morning. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God that testifies through creation, that he giveth the rain, that he giveth the, the fruit and the harvest and all these things. You know, we look at this world around us and we think, well, that's just, uh, and, and the uh, unsaved, they say, well, that's just chance. You know, it's just the, the process of time and evolution and uh, it all just, happened, you know, no, no, we, we know better than that, don't we? Many of the unsaved even know better than that. The educated do not want to admit that, but most of the unsaved even have to acknowledge that all of this had to have some kind of designer. It's just too obvious, amen? And here we see the witness of God in his creation, amen? And we could go on and on with that, but here, Paul, he just... He, he starts from that, from that point because, remember, these are Gentiles. They're not familiar with the Old Testament. They don't know the Jehovah. They don't know him as Jehovah, but he is your creator, and you owe him homage. Not us, not me. It's, I'm just a man. I'm just, I'm just Paul of Tarsus. I'm just, you know, a, a common man. But this God, he's your creator, and he's the one who can be your savior. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in Jerusalem, and he rose up from the dead three days later, and now he's offering forgiveness of sins to you. That same God, the one who has sustained you all these times, the one who has provided the rain and the harvest, he's the one who now offers you forgiveness of sins. He preached to them the power of God, and he preached to them the witness of God, having God over and over uh, had offered them, uh, <clears throat> verse 16, he said, he suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. You know, the, the, the truth of it is that the moment we sin, God has the right to throw us in hell. Amen. Uh, how many sins will lead you to hell? How, how many sins will condemn you to hell? One. How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? I mean, how do you have to steal to be a stealer, be a thief? One. 
How many times you got to commit adultery to be an adulterer or adulteress? One. One. That's it. One sin condemns anybody to hell. But how many times over and over, God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Amen. God extended his, his mercy over and over. And not only his mercy, but his grace and that he's, he bestows goodness. You know, there are lost people, they're living a good life. They're enjoying the benefits of, you know, of this, this world around us. They have a good job. They have a nice home. Why is that? Because God's long-suffering. Oh, but their day's coming. Judgment will come. We don't know when. We don't know how long their life will go, but God is long-suffering, and he gives them opportunity. He gives them you know, the, the opportunity to hear the gospel and respond over and over. God is a patient God. Amen. We see then, verse 18, with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done a sacrifice unto them. Paul had to go on the defense. Boy, that, and that, that's something we don't normally see in Paul. Normally he's on the offense. He's proclaiming, he's proclaiming the message and people are getting saved. But here in Lystra, he had to go on the defense. They were going to worship him and Barnabas. And sadly, at this point, no one got saved. But hey, Paul preached the message. He was faithful to the message. He proclaimed Christ. He proclaimed the Savior he, through creation. Amen. And he, he uh, took on the false doctrine that was presented there and the false worship that was presented. And he took a stand for the Lord. Amen. You know, we need to take that stand. We need to proclaim the message. He preached the gospel. And he had the opportunity. That's the kind of opportunity we need to be looking for. Again, remember, this lame man, there was an opportunity to show the power of God. And he took that opportunity. Amen. And God used that. And we'll see how he used it later. Uh, and the, the message tonight, I don't have time to go through it all. I wish I did. All right, I really do. But um, I don't. But let's take a stand for the Lord, child of God. Hey, when God gives us the opportunity, let's stand in faith and authority. Amen. Let, let's not just be you know, uh, uh, hid in a corner, so to speak. Let's be bold in our faith like the Apostle Paul was. And let's call out the false doctrine. You know, when we see uh, people being led astray, we need to warn them. Amen. And share the truth in love, but share the truth. Amen. Let's not back down. And I promise God will honor that. And God will reward that. We'll see tonight how God did that even here in Lystra. Amen. But let's take a stand in our faith. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm not so sure I am a child of God. Well, then you stand here like these at Lystra. If you're here and maybe you're just paying, you're paying lip service to God. Maybe you're here and you've come to church so that, well, I know it's the right thing to do. And I know church is, is good and maybe God will kind of even out the, the scale with me in the end, you know, and God will look on my favor and let me in. It doesn't work that way, my friend. Again, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done. According to his mercy, he saved us. Amen. And if you are, are trying to earn your way into favor with God, today's the day you need to just forsake all that. It's vanities. Like Paul said to these, these here at Lystra, it's vanity. It's worthless. It's not going to get you into heaven in the end. Jesus Christ is the only way. Amen. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If that's you this morning, you need to make that choice. You need to choose Christ. Amen. We need to remain faithful to be witness, witnessing for the Lord. Amen. Let's close the word of prayer. Lord, we